Okay. So this week we will do kind of a primer on blockchain technology and on blockchains. And we will learn how to create our own cryptocurrency. So on Wednesday, I would like you to be able to receive and send a new made up cryptocurrency that we will create. Um, so that's the task for Wednesday. For today, we will talk a little bit more abstractly about the tech stack. And then I will tell you what to install and what to read a little bit more about. So let's start by checking what you already know about blockchain. So what is blockchain? And what is it for? What does it give us? No markers. No markers. Paper marker. That's not a. That should not be by the way for them. Oh, crap. I'm going to hunt for some markers. There is one here. So, what do you know about blockchain? What is it? Yeah, should be. Any ideas, any summaries? What can you tell me? It's a form of a distributed database. Yeah, that's pretty good. What else? So we can say it's this distributed database. So what's unique? So if I have, if I, let's say I have uh, some SQL, SQL or no SQL, uh, MongoDB, for example, spread over uh, multiple hosts, and I have a distributed database, I have um, nodes uh, with some communication between them, and I have this distributed database, I don't, let's say we use Mongo DB. What would be the difference from a uh, blockchain? So what what is different to a distributed kind of traditional distributed database to a blockchain? There are some similarities. So similarities are we have multiple nodes. Um, Communicating and the uh, information is where is the information in, in here, in this case, and in this case. So in the in the case of the uh, Mongo, we can have, um, we can have two things. We can have um, kind of a distribution, uh, which often means partitioning, partitioning of data. And we can have uh, redundancy, which means kind of a replication. 
replication, right? So in here, we can talk about two cases. So let's say I have a table of, um, so let's talk about SQL database. Uh, I have a table and I have, uh, let's say name and surname. And then I have another table and it says uh, course ID, course ID and the name of the course, okay? And then I have a relationship uh, between the students and the courses they take, right? So I have kind of another table which combines IDs of students and IDs of, um, of courses, right? So we have kind of a very primitive uh, setup where we have students, courses, and the relationship between them. And now I have four servers, four nodes, and I can say, okay, I will store students here. I will store uh, courses here, and I will store the who is taking what here, right? So I can kind of uh, distribute it into uh, kind of a different posts by table, okay? But I can also say, well, I actually have some students, let's say we have another attribute and they, they the attribute is a city. So I have students in Trondheim and students in Javik. And I say, okay, actually I want to have kind of a Trondheim being in Trondheim such that I can have a very proximity to the host. So I can run my queries faster about Trondheim students. And I will have Jovic students, so Trondheim are on those two servers, and Jovic students are here, and I kind of a partition data based on some attribute, right? So I have both students and uh, courses, students and courses, students and courses, but I don't partition it per table, I partition it kind of uh, based on some sort of attribute, okay? So that's, I'm, I'm kind of a distributing the data across the, the different hosts. So that's about this. And then I can also say, well, I basically have uh, four hosts, um, uh, four hosts, and I have kind of a redundancy such that if one of the nodes goes out, the other one kind of has exactly the same copy, right? So I have four servers, and then if one goes out and I have a failure, the system still works because there is a redundancy and I have this kind of a spur capacity where I duplicated everything, right? Um, so we have kind of uh, those two, two points, right? So the data can be kind of repeated sometimes on multiple hosts if we want redundancy, but if we don't want redundancy, then we don't need to have those two servers. We can kind of just do it Trondheim and Jovic, right? Usually we want redundancy. We want kind of a failover capability. Uh, so we kind of spread information like this. So in the blockchain, if I have my data, so, if, if I kind of imagine that I have some something to store, how it is stored here. That there is kind of a, like blockchain uses just one model, um, most like for all the, for all the data. What, what is it? So if this is my data, and this was the data we kind of explained. Yeah, sometimes data is here, part of the data is here, part data is here. We can do different partitioning and then some of the copies of the data are kind of here or, or there, right? So in case of the blockchain, what? how does it look like? Peer to peer, yes. And which peers have data? all the peers have all the data. So it's very dumb mechanism. So this node, this node, this node, and this node, they all have the copy of the data, right? So we have kind of a total redundancy. We don't have any distribution, right? Or, or you could say, uh, we don't care about partitioning the data. There is a kind of a new mechanisms coming along like a sharding which are trying to implement it. They are trying to partition who needs to know about what, such that not everybody needs to know about everything. But by far the majority currently of existing models is 
all the nodes basically have the full copy of the of the data, right? So if I want to become a Bitcoin node or Ethereum node, uh, I start up my client, and the first thing the client needs to do is need to sync the database to contain everything. So you basically, if you join the network, so if you have a new node, which is joining the network, uh, then you kind of connect to some neighbors. And then all you do is you say, okay, uh, let's give me the block number zero, give me the block number one. And it goes until now. So it gets the history of all things that happen. And it basically creates a kind of a local copy of all the transactions and everything that happened so far, right? Uh, so that's kind of the, uh, there are some similarities, but there are some di di differences between the distributed database and, and this. We basically keep the, the entire copy, right? And in the case of, um, <clears throat> in the case of uh, Ethereum, if you want really the full copy of the entire blockchain from the very beginning, it's very kind of large. It's about 12 terabytes. Uh, so your node needs to kind of store uh, 12 terabytes of, of stuff. Um, <clears throat> can you work without storing everything? Can you have a node which kind of uh, can validate transactions without storing everything? Not really. Uh, in, in Ethereum, you have two things. We will talk a little bit about it in a moment. Um, but you basically, to verify that the new things are kind of correct, you have to have the whole history such that you can kind of check that things are not violating any of the previous uh, hashes and previous things that has happened before, right? Um, so in sim simplicity, you cannot validate things without the, the having the copy of the database, right? The whole copy of the data. But you can be a node, which is not validating nodes. So if I initiate a node and I connect to those guys and I didn't create the full copy, right? I don't have the full copy of the database. Uh, and then if I issue a transaction, this node can broadcast it, but this node cannot validate that this transaction is correct. Right, those nodes will validate it, but this node will not be able to validate it. But it will be kind of like a, a proxy node, which allows me to talk to the to the blockchain, right, to the rest of the validating nodes. Okay, what else? So distributed database analogy is very good. Uh, it's a kind of a special database analogy, which means we're not really doing distribution or partitioning we kind of just doing a total redundancy. If we have 4,000 Bitcoin nodes, all 4,000 nodes have the entire Bitcoin blockchain copy, right? What else? What else is a kind of a good analogy or difference between these two? So, if I have if I have this scenario with my SQL database and students and city and the courses, who decides which data is where? Who decides that? Uh, uh, working that well, but can you see something from that from the board? <laughs> All right, so uh, what is this? The database management system, right? There is some kind of a software layer which decides what goes where and how things work and kind of coordinates things, right? So what happens if I have your big data and those we kind of using the original thing we want redundancy we have your big data in those two hosts um the database management system is kind of like in the middle coordinating everything and i have i don't know a record about marius uh, here and here and marius is taking a new course or dropping out of the course i'm dropping out of the decentralization course right so here we remove that um, 
that I'm, I'm not taking the course, but here I didn't, I have inconsistency, right? So who manages the consistency of the data? The DBMS, right? So DBMS makes sure that I have kind of a consistent data across all the partitions and all the distributed uh, hosts that I'm kind of running, right? So who manages that here? Yeah, that's the, the whole point, right? So the whole point of blockchain is that this kind of a manager, uh, the manager is sort of uh, decentralized. It doesn't exist as a single unit. So here there is always kind of an owner of DBMS who manages that and who manages the software and manages the, uh, the uh, consistency of the data. Here, we don't have this. We don't have the kind of the manager, trusted manager who manages that for us. We have kind of a decentralized manager, which works in a limited trust environment. So each of those nodes can be a malicious node, can be trying to pretend that something has happened, but it hasn't happened. So we need kind of a consensus. So there is kind of a consensus driven or consensus based consistency of the data right that's the whole point of of blockchains so blockchains have kind of the biggest difference between distributed database and blockchain is that in blockchains we don't have trust with the participants right so if you have kind of an environment where each of the node is not trusted uh specifically, uh, then the distributed database solution would not work because um, you kind of need to agree on certain software that runs and runs consistently across the all the nodes that you are using, right? So each node here is using software which is compatible with this DBMS. Here, that's not the case. We don't actually have the same software running all of those nodes. We have kind of the same protocol, uh, which is implementation independent. And each of those guys can be running their own version of the protocol. And they may try to cheat. They may try to do something that is malicious. But the protocol, based on this consensus, enforces a data consistency. So at the end of the day, we are guaranteed that the data, this kind of a data which each of these nodes has, and which kind of is an abstract representation of this kind of a global state, global data is consistent, that there is no anomalies, right? And it kind of works depending on the consensus algorithm used. You may want 50% of or more than 50% of honest nodes to participate, or some algorithms require more than two thirds, right? Uh, we don't have algorithms which can work in a majority of the nodes being untrusted, right? We, uh, if majority of the network is malicious, then the outcomes will be manipulated by this malicious majority, right? Uh, but if the majority of the network is honest, so if the majority, like more than 50% or uh, more than two thirds, depending on the algorithm being used, then the consensus will ensure that this data is consistent and it's not manipulated, right? Does it make sense? So where would you use a database and where would you use a blockchain? Well, it kind of is actually quite a hard question because most people get it wrong. Um, you Most of the time where people are talking about blockchain and using blockchain, it makes no sense to use blockchain. It actually makes much more sense to use distributed database instead. Um, so for example, if you have stakeholders that are bound by legal obligations or, or trust, let's say hospitals, and they need to do something together, then there is no point using blockchain because they can just have distributed database and kind of run a, a joint DBMS, which ensures the data consistency across all the hospitals, right? Um, so you could say, well, but I don't trust that the hospital. What if they manipulate my data? What if they put something that is kind of uh, not correct, right? 
then, well, it depends on the application because blockchain doesn't prevent you putting rubbish in into the blockchain, right? That's not the point of, of blockchain solving your data kind of quality issue. What blockchains guarantees is that it makes sure that things that are put in cannot be changed later, right? But if you have a wrong data and you put the wrong data in, it will kind of accept it. Like data is just data, right? So if someone puts in a fake data, it will be still rubbish, but blockchain doesn't prevent it, right? It just makes sure that things that have went in are consistent and kind of are not being changed later. Um, so there are some, some things where people kind of get a, a little bit of uh, uh, confused uh, where it kind of makes sense. So, so far, the, the biggest killer app for blockchains was what, or is what? What's the kind of the application of blockchains that um, they were originally designed for, that, you know, a Bitcoin experiment was for, uh, and we don't have uh, a better way of doing it. So it's currency. Or more specifically, a decentralized currency. So decentralized currency. We're going to spend uh, a, a lecture one or two weeks on, on specifically that. So I'm going to kind of disregard it. We, we're not going to follow that line of thinking and that line of uh, discussing it. But that's kind of... Uh, basically a kind of a killer app for blockchains because we don't have a better way of having something that has property of a currency but it's not controlled by anything right uh the best so far we had is a uh, government issued uh central bank currencies uh which every country has um and kind of a eurozone has as well uh which is kind of controlled by the consortium let's say um but we don't really have a one which is designed in limited trust environment where it kind of comes from people themselves, right? Uh, so for that purpose, kind of a blockchain is a perfect match for the, for the uh, use case, right? Um, but let's forget about it for a moment. So what's the kind of a second, um, second uh, useful feature of blockchains that we, um, have as a side effect of Bitcoin, for example. So what can you do with Bitcoin blockchain uh, that um, is kind of easy and kind of comes for free, sort of, uh, that you cannot really do um, in a, a different non-decentralized way? So you can, so, so remember that um, blockchain is um, a chain of blocks uh, starting from the Genesis block number zero. Uh, and then each block contains a list of transactions. So there are kind of uh, transactions that each block contains. And the transactions have uh, this kind of a token. In, in the case of a cryptocurrency, they have kind of a value being kind of a transferred from one transaction to another transaction. So kind of some sort of a numerical value can be, can, can be linked between all the transactions. But then they also have some sort of a metadata. So what you can do in, in Bitcoin, for example, is you can attach uh, a binary or, or um, ASCII data uh, into each of the transactions, right? So you can kind of uh, inject a transaction which has this kind of a metadata, metadata, and this metadata can be kind of anything, right? It can be a hash of some sort, it can be a text, it can be kind of anything. So because of that, what you can do, for example, is you can hash a document 
and then you can inject that hash into the transactions and that becomes a proof that this particular document, uh, so if I have a document and I create a hash of this document and I uh, put it into the blockchain, that kind of gives me a timestamp uh, of existence, of existence, right? So the the blockchain can be used as a kind of a timestamping, um, timestamping uh, facility, which allows you to prove to anybody that a cert certain thing existed at a certain time, right? Uh, so you can kind of uh, make a claim that a certain document existed at a certain time, even though you didn't reveal the content of the document, right? Um, so you can kind of uh, use it for proving that something has been contract or some agreement or some, I don't know, something kind of a patent has existed on that particular date, right? The other thing is it allows you to get into agreements, right? Because you can say, I married somebody on that day. Uh, and then the proof of that is here, is in the blockchain because the both parties signed kind of a document using the public keys and then they signed together something and they logged the hash of the of whatever they signed uh into the blockchain and then you can kind of have kind of a provable way of saying that thing took place on that day right that signing took place on that day right uh, you 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 even don't need to use the metadata for that uh, so much because the transactions can have the mechanism for people to be signing the transactions and you can have a multi-signature transactions which require multiple people to sign a transaction to be valid. And then once two people sign the transaction, it will become part of the of the data of the, of the blockchain and then you can always prove that those two people signed that transaction on that time, on that date, right? So why do we need that for? Why, why is that useful? Well, it kind of boils down to, to trust and to institutions that we have. Like, how do we deal with marriage in a society? We have to go to a kind of a central office. We have to sign something. And then the kind of certain office says, yes, those two people came to here on that date and they signed it. They agreed to this, right? How do we make contracts? It's the same. We use kind of a legal representative to say, yeah, that person bought a house from that person. I certify that th that happened, right? Uh, so we basically using a trusted third party to guarantee certain trust relationships between things that we do in society, right? Um, so with this, with this kind of a blockchain uh, concept, we can do those things without the trusted third party because we have sort of an equivalent. We have a mechanism saying, Yep, th this thing happened in the world uh, on that day and those two people or three people or whoever was involved and this guarantees that it happened, right? And we don't need to have a trusted third party to, to confirm that. So that's the biggest advantage, right? So uh, it is kind of a form of distributed database. And then the last one is it's kind of a um, replacement, replacement, or uh, trusted, trusted third party, right? So that's what that's when it actually gets quite interesting. So let's me let me share my screen, and I will kind of a carry on. Yeah. So let's jump a little bit. I don't have a slide for that. So um, I should have, yeah, I have this one. All right, so I have a question of uh, kind of a creative projects. So if, so so we kind of covered two, two aspects already. So one is a distributed decentralized database without the trusted manager uh, because it just kind of automatically happened. And the second more important one is that a replacement for a trusted third party. So now the, the last one. 
Um, if we talk about kind of creative, uh, creative projects like um, you know, someone painted a, a painting. Um, you know, um, uh, Munk has created this famous scream painting, right? We all know it. So how how do we know it? How how it happened that we all know the painting? I never seen the original painting myself actually, but I know how it looks like. Why? Yeah, because a lot of people took pictures of it. There is a lot of copies of that original painting, right? Um, so same with movies, uh, same with uh, anything like uh, writing something or books or whatever. So how those creative artifacts, how those things created by people stay in the world? How, how does it happen? So, so there are two things. One is that there is always an original and there is a copy, right? Uh, for most physical creative things or physical things, um, it's very clear of what is the original and what is a copy, right? Uh, for digital things, there is no difference between the original and the copy. They they are identical, right? So that's that's the first point. Uh, in digital realm, our desire to distinguish original from a copy kind of breaks down a little bit, right? And we have two paradoxes. One paradox is the DRM industry, which tries to say that copy of the digital medium of a song is the original the legal one but this one isn't right so we're trying to build a machinery which distinguishes kind of the original from the copy but you know if you take the original and the copy they are identical they are exactly the same the only difference is the metadata about it like the industry tries to distinguish the drm copy from a non-drm copy right and as soon as you break the drm the digital rate uh, rights management system you basically have the kind of the original, like it's the same thing, right? So that's one, one important point. Um, the second one is we have NFTs, which tries to create a digital thing that tries to be unique, that tries to be uh, not kind of uh, uh, some, something that is digital, but it's not possible to copy it to the same extent that it's identical, right? Uh, so. How does that happen? Well, we kind of try to attach kind of, a, again, a metadata or some history to something and say, this thing and this thing are kind of look exactly the same. They look identical, but they are not because of these extra things, right? Um, so that, I mean, we, we're not gonna talk about it here, but my point is that uh, copying something digitally is much easy and kind of uh, often there is no this, this difference between the original and the copy, right? And the second thing is that people do this. People take photographs, people take, um, you know, we used to not have a written uh, media. We, we told stories and we sang songs and that's how things moved on from generation to generation, right? By people copying it, by people kind of repeating it. Um, so the same is, is here. So a lot of things stay in the world because people carry those things kind of through the generations and through the, the different media. Uh, and we also have institu institutionalized this. So we have libraries, we have archives, we have museums, and they kind of uh, keep things for us, right? Uh, a lot of museums don't display the originals, they display copies and they keep the originals to kind of uh, keep them, you know, um, for a longer period of time, right? Uh, so we're kind of trying to maintain this. We're trying to do this. Uh, and that's, again, something blockchain is touching on because it allows us to store something beyond the duration of our lifetimes or beyond the duration of certain time frame. 
uh, because we kind of uh, can keep the history or can keep some artifacts for an extended period of time, right? Um, so let's let's move on. So what we need to do to play with this with this technology, you need a couple of toys. Um, so uh, you will need to have a, uh, an ability to issue transactions and to check transactions. Um, and for that, you need to have a node. So you need to have a software which follows the protocol, which runs this kind of a protocol on your computer, right? So we need to have a node. Uh, and for Ethereum and specifically, uh, you will kind of use, um, we will use Go implementation, so Go Ethereum. Uh, so this is kind of a note. Why we want Ethereum? Because it has certain properties that are kind of easy to discuss, uh, which um, makes it kind of interesting. So we could do some things with Bitcoin, but um, or other blockchains, but some things are kind of much nicer and more robust to, to do with Ethereum and it has certain properties which other don't have. Um, then you need some form of uh, development environment uh, where you can test and run and compile your smart contracts. So for that, we use Remix. Um, so there are a couple of uh, options. Remix is the kind of uh, uh, the de facto one. And then we have uh, Truffle, Truffle, which is an uh, additional one which we can use also. So you have links on the slides. I will put the slides onto the, the lecture uh, wiki. And you basically install those three things. And then we will not play with the real Ethereum. We will play with a testnet, right? So you have to instruct your setup such that they all use kind of the same testnet. Uh, and the testnet will be created by Truffle, right? So you will kind of create your own blockchain, your own kind of a node uh, using Truffle. And then you, because you do that, you don't kind of really need to use this one. Uh, and then you will use Remix to interact and program uh, the blockchain and kind of uh, see what, what happens, right? So if you want to play with the real testnet, you will have to have this. But if you want to only play with your own testnet on your local laptop, you only need those two, right? We will talk a little bit more on, on Wednesday. All right, so what is Ethereum? Um, I have a couple of uh, buzzwords here. So uh, Ethereum is a global computing platform, right? So that's what we talked about, this kind of a global thing that anybody can store timestamp things but nobody can manipulate and, and, and change or delete, right? Um, it is a, a form of blockchain, which has kind of a, a virtual machine built into it, such that you can execute kind of a computer programs on it. Uh, so this virtual machine is called EVM, Ethereum Virtual Machine. It is uh, a stack-based uh, virtual machine uh, and it's, not nice to work with it directly uh, because it's kind of a low level virtual machine. So you want to have kind of a higher order programming language, which gets compiled to this low level uh, representation. So what virtual machines you know already? What virtual machines have you been exposed to? Give me some examples. Come on. Have you used Java? Of course you've used Java. So Java is a programming language on top of Java virtual machine called JVM. And the virtual machine of Java is also stack based. It's not register based. Um, so EVM and JVM are very similar because they use kind of the same paradigm for implementing the low level bytecode and low level behavior. 
What other virtual machines that you know? Uh, did you program in C sharp? What C sharp runs on? Dot net. Dot net is a virtual machine which you can get your C plus plus and C sharp code compiled into, and then this code from the JVM dot um, net is compiled into machine code, right? But it kind of .NET is a virtual machine which separates your real hardware and real architecture from the actual programming language. Uh, you're using browsers. What's inside a browser? Well, there is a virtual machine which converts your JavaScript into a representation that the browsers can interpret and execute such that you have some kind of automatic behavior because of your JavaScript, right? There is a, you know, V8. V8 is a virtual machine for JavaScript developed by, by Google, which the, you know, Node.js is using, right? Node.js is using heavy the use of this kind of a virtual machine for, for JavaScript. So virtual machines are very abundant, like very common. We use them everywhere. Uh, they create a layer which separates us from the actual hardware such that we can kind of uh, have a layer of independence of what the hardware is actually doing, right? So in the case of Solidity, it's even more uh, because it's not only separates us from a hardware, it actually separates us from the programming language which implements what's actually being done, right? So it's sort of like a virtual machine which doesn't get compiled directly into any machine code or any kind of real implementation. It, it is very abstract that it gets compiled or interpreted by some programming language or something that implements that behavior, right? And you can have the implementation in C++, in Golang, or in whatever other language you want. Uh, so you are kind of having a sort of a, you know, abstraction layer which isolates you from the actual thing that will interpret and execute it, right? And you can have that those interpretations and executions done kind of in an arbitrary way. So originally there were a couple of programming languages on Ethereum, uh, but they are not used, they are not in use anymore. So when EVM was being kind of developed originally and kind of uh, went through some iterations, there were other programming languages and compilers which were built for EVM, but basically we kind of uh, settled on Solidity. And that's de facto programming language, which is used for um, EVM. Can you have blockchains with other uh, programming languages or other virtual machines? Of course you can. So Hyperledger Ares uh, is using Golang as a kind of a programming language for day smart contracts, no, not Ares, uh, Hyperledger uh, Fabric. Uh, and uh, Neo and some other projects are using WebAssembly instead. So WebAssembly became a little bit more um, kind of a modern way of approaching the, the problem, right? So it's sort of, a, it's a better idea. Sa same as .NET is a better implementation of the virtual machine for cross language and cross platform development compared to JVM. It's the same with uh, some of the new upcoming uh, VMs. Um, Cardano is using a Haskell and kind of using Haskell language and some sort of functional interpretations of what smart contracts should be doing and how they can be verified. Uh, so, you know, EVM and Solidity is not, not the only one, but we have to use something. And for the sake of experimenting, it's, it's a good, uh, good starting point. All right. So, um, we um so when we come back to this kind of creativity and storage thing and how things uh stay in the world um in the old days in the you know ancient history as i said like even before our printing press we kind of told stories to our children our children told stories to their children and we sang songs and we drew paintings on some caves and things were kind of very decentralized, right? So things stayed in the world because everything was kind of decentralized. Uh, with the modern times, 
uh, how things stay in the world is a little bit complicated because some things stay in the world because of human activities. They are kind of informal, but me taking photo of, you know, Mona Lisa or Scream, the, the painting, uh, doesn't really make it last for that long. Uh, I'm, I'm going to, you know, be dead in a few years and then my storage or my things will kind of be gone. Uh, so we kind of rely on centralized um, uh, gatekeepers, right? So if the show goes out of Netflix, can you watch the show again? Sometimes you can't, right? Unless you have some pirated copy somewhere or your friends kind of recorded it, right? Uh, so things are a little bit kind of a closed and a little bit controlled. So it's the same here. Um, IPFS and kind of Ethereum were sort of are trying to make things open and accessible to people such that we can have this kind of us storage and engagement with others and doing kind of different applications and different things in kind of a more open uh, permissionless way. Uh, so there are kind of a three properties open such that anybody anywhere can engage, right? So Ethereum blockchain is a global uh, project. It's accessible anywhere. Even if you are behind some firewalls or whatever, you can always issue transactions and engage with the, with the blockchain. Um, it's persistent, which means nobody will ever delete anything unless the whole project go goes to hell. But uh, that's kind of as long as people are doing it, it's unlikely to happen. And then you don't need a permission. Like you don't need any gatekeeper to allow you to enter or to do things with it, right? Um, so then it sort of ends up being a global computer with storage state and atomic transactions which are based on this consensus-based uh, metaphor. So um, we have um, we have sort of invented kind of this global computer, which can be utilized for various things. And it's uh, not bound to a particular jurisdiction. And the applications you can do on it are kind of not limited neither. Um, so if we think about programming it, we have to now consider what is, what is it that we are programming? So what exactly are we programming? It's, it's not a normal application programming. It's not like a mobile app that we program and distribute and people are using it. It's a little bit, something a little bit different. So there are sort of, um, I consider it four. Some people consider it three. Um, kind of levels. So on the lowest level, what we what we do, we program smart contracts, right? So smart contracts are small pieces of code which provide kind of a modular unit functionality which can be deployed onto the Ethereum blockchain or, or blockchain in general. And then we have decentralized applications. So decentralized applications, it's it, it is something that... Um, uh, combines multiple contracts and interfaces with the real world, right? Um, and then if you want to build something that has stakeholders and they make decisions, we often call it about DAO. DAO is a kind of a dis distributed, decentralized, autonomous organization, which combines multiple people to make decisions and kind of govern the DAP, which is developed kind of in a, uh, by the community. And then we have sort of institutions, which we don't really have yet, but they, that's the possibility of having where we have basically um, uh, a large group of people governing a large number of organizations or large number of interactions, right? So it's kind of like a mini country where you would kind of say those people with which are part of that institution are kind of governing what it means to do certain things certain way and they kind of dictate the um, the kind of a constitution of how certain uh, DAOs are established and how they kind of work, right? So we, we don't have the last one, uh, the, the kind of a distributed self-sovereign institutions. We are at the point of experimenting and deploying DAOs and DAPs and smart contracts, right? Um, we will start with smart, simple smart contracts, and then we can talk 
how they can be turned into a, a DAO, right? And we will give some, some examples. Any questions about that? Does it make sense? All right, so let's focus on smart contracts. What are those? Um, it's a little bit, uh, it takes a little bit of a mental uh, gymnastics to uh, to imagine what the smart contract is compared to, let's say, a mobile app on a, you know, Apple store or, or, or Google Play store. So let's imagine that we want to play rock, paper, scissors, okay? So when I play with you, can, can we play it here? Yes, of course we can play, right? So we say one, two, three, and we play, right? So how about we want to play with people in um, in Nepal, okay? Uh, can we play uh, rock, paper, scissors with people in Nepal? Well, we kind of, it's a little bit hard, right? Uh, because there is a lag and there is a bit of a delay, right? So. When we say one, two, three, uh, and we show what we want to show, let's say I want to show paper, uh, there is a bit of a lag before I know what they showed. And if they showed it a little bit too late, then they could have seen what I've shown. And there is this kind of a problem of, um, you know, <laughs> of the game not being fair. Like if they, kind of uh, saw what I showed before they make the decision. And I, I don't know how they're gonna do this, right? So we kind of need to have some sort of mechanism ensuring that I and them are not gonna cheat, right? So how are we gonna do this? Well, the, the traditional way of solving it is we need a trusted third party, right? So we need to have somebody who we both, we trust. And then I'm going to that person and I, or I'm calling that person and I'm saying, Look, I'm gonna show paper, okay? And they say, okay, fine. Don't don't tell anybody. Like, I your secret is with me. And then they will wait until the Nepalese people tell what they want to show, right? And they say, okay, yeah, we want to show rock, okay? And then the the convener, the trusted third party says, okay, uh, Marius won, right? Uh, paper beats rock, and I won, right? Uh, so can we play rock, paper, scissors without a trusted third party? And it's like, yes, we just have the re replacement of a trusted um, trusted third party with the blockchain, right? So now how it would look like is I'm issuing a transaction where I'm saying I'm, I'm doing paper, but I hashed my, my, um, my commitment, right? So I committed to paper, but it's not visible yet, right? Um, it's sort of something that I committed to, it's in the blockchain, but I didn't reveal what it is yet, right? And now I'm waiting for the Nepalese people to say what they commit to. And they commit to something which I don't know what it is. But once we have two commitments, then we can reveal because they cannot change their commitment anymore, right? Once they commit it, they, that's it. They cannot kind of manipulate it and change it to something else. So now I can reveal what, I, what my commitment was uh, and I'm kind of... Uh, you know, usually you, you do it by some sort of a salt for the hash, uh, such that you kind of can uncover what the original thing was. Um, they've done the same. And then, you know, we have the result, right? Uh, so there is a very simple protocol, which we can use using kind of a blockchain with the uh, kind of a state-like machine to solve this. And, and people have done it. Um, I'm I'm do doing this lecture for the last you know I I've done this lecture for the first time in um, uh, 2015 I think uh, so it's been it's been going on for a while and I was just checking this uh, this rock paper scissors and I was sort of uh, surprised that it, they've done it seven years ago <laughs> it's like shit that's old um, so it's kind of uh, like a rock paper scissors using solidity. Uh, and you can check the uh, the source code and how how they've kind of done this um, this particular protocol of playing this particular game, right? Um, so, all right. So what else can you do? Um, so you can kind of uh, specify simple games. Uh, you can also specify, um, yeah. The, another one is a clock. Uh, so for example, in um, 
you want to, I don't know, transfer money to somebody at some certain point or give them a gift or you want something to happen at a spe specific uh, time, right? Um, so what you can do is, normally what, what would you do? Um, again, you would have to either go to a lawyer says, okay, when uh, those conditions are met, I want this to happen, right? Uh, and then you trust that, that they will execute what you want, right? But to do it in a trustless way, again, you can use blockchain, you can use Ethereum, and you can set up like, a, in, in this particular case, you're basically setting up a transaction which will take place when the certain conditions are met based on the um, uh, uh, smart contract that, that you implement. Okay, so a, a, a smart contract is a, a piece of executable code which cannot be manipulated, which doesn't require trusted third party for execution and can combine an uh, idea of timestamping something with assigning something with a, some sort of a protocol. And it can be like a state machine which gets triggered by something and then it kind of follows the, the state machine rules, right? Um, so the next kind of uh, concept that is important is uh, oracles. So everything that happens inside the blockchain is safe and guaranteed and consensus-based and cannot be manipulated and all that nice things, right? But this is inside the blockchain itself. So if we have some conditions which relate to the real world, we have to interface to the real world, right? So if I want, for example, to say, I want this transaction to be run at block uh, 12 million, then there is nothing out from the outside world. The contract will kind of refer to the state of the blockchain and at the block 12 million, it will do it, right? Because it's internal to the blockchain. But if I say, I want this transaction to happen when the US dollar goes below I don't know, 80 cents of a uh, euro, then it kind of, we need to have this information to come from the outside world into the blockchain, right? And that's what oracles are. Oracles are interfaces between the events from the real world into the events inside the blockchain, such that the smart contracts can do something or can be triggered by some real world event, right? Um, this is complicated because normally you would have to trust somebody to put that information in, right? Um, so how would you how would you trust that a certain event from outside world actually took place? Well, it's it's kind of a complicated, and usually what people do, they have some incentive mechanisms, again, some consensus rules of saying, if um, you know, if some people say the dollar went below eighty cents, and that is true, then they don't lose the kind of the the stake that they put for putting that information in. But if there is a person who says no, that has not happened, and that person is wrong, they will lose the stake because then you you revert to some sort of a mechanism which. Uh, uh, prevents people from lying, right? And you, it kind of works in some sort of a social context where you have people saying what has happened and people saying what has not happened. And then you can kind of uh, pay those people who don't lie from the punishments of those people who lie, right? And normally nobody is lying and no, nobody, like normally the information which goes through the Oracle is correct. They might be different mechanisms. You may, for example, have trust coming from that trusted source. So you can say, I trust Norges Bank. And if the Norges Bank says Norwegian Krona rate on that day is that, then that's kind of like a public, publicly known fact. And you can sort of uh, link kind of a web crawler to the Norges Bank website and put Norges Bank exchange rate tables into the blockchain and that becomes an oracle, right? And the verifi verification is you just go to Norges Bank and check, oh yeah, that, that was they published and that's what the rate was, right? Um, so you can have kind of um, different mechanisms of doing um, the link between the real world 
and the blockchain information. And again, over the years, they have been kind of uh, interesting projects happening. Uh, so we had, for example, linking phone numbers to Ethereum identity. Uh, and then we had some sort of a linking social media account to Ethereum identity, such that you have reputation and kind of a know your customer uh, situations uh, sorted. I checked those uh, those links. Um, sorry, I checked those uh, Ethereum oracles, and they didn't work anymore. So the proof of fund didn't work, uh, and the mining pools are also kind of not. Um, uh, relevant. So th those are kind of obsolete. So I mark those slides as obsolete. All right. So let's have a five minute break and then we will talk about solidity. Um, five minutes or 10 minutes? Five is okay. Perfect. So we start at um, 20 past, 21 past. I will pause. So I will cover the basics, but I encourage you to kind of check some of the resources yourself. Um, so there is um, a website like uh, solidityLang.org, which has all the latest docs. And then you can check uh, all the features of the language here. Um, we will kind of cover this contract in a moment. I will kind of talk with you about this one in a moment. But let's uh, have kind of a general overview. So what is Solidity? Solidity is a programming language, of course. It's object-oriented a little bit. It, it's kind of contract-oriented. Like, you know, we don't create classes. We create kind of a contract. Um, and then uh, it has kind of a messaging built in. So you can issue messages and you can kind of receive and like receive and emit messages. Um, and the interesting thing, so all those things are very similar to JavaScript. It, it is actually inspired and based on the JavaScript syntax. So the syntax is kind of very Java-ish, JavaScript-ish. Um, and it, it is a typed language. So unlike JavaScript, it, it, it has a kind of a strict typing uh, in, inside the language. So it's, it's uh, typed. But it has kind of a interesting features. So if you want to deploy your contract, you have to pay. If you want to run it, if anyone wants to run it, they have to pay. And if you want to store something, you have to pay. <laughs> so for, for those reasons, it's kind of very similar to cloud computing and to you know uh, Amazon EC2 or EC3, right? Uh, EC2 for computing and EC3, uh, S3 for um, storage, right? If you want to store something in the cloud, you have to pay fees, right? So it's the same here. Um, and because of that, you kind of need to think how can you optimize it, right? How can you optimize your contract such that whoever is using it and for you yourself, that you minimize the costs, right? Uh, why do we have that? Why do we have these costs built in? Um, well, if you kind of think about it, it, it is kind of like a global computer. It is kind of like an Amazon instance with storage. So somebody needs to maintain it. And people who are maintaining it are the uh, miners or the people who are kind of validating and running the nodes. And they need to be incentivized to, to do that. And they are incentivized by this cryptocurrency and this cryptocurrency is something that is kind of built in. So the people who are using the infrastructure are the ones who has to cover the cost of running the infrastructure, right? All right. so. Primitive types, very simple. We have um, unsigned integers and integers up to 256 uh, with bytes like single byte all the way to 32 bytes. We have strings, which are UTF-8 encoded. We have arrays. We have uh, associative maps, which are called mappings. Uh, and then we have bool type and the address type. Um, the address type is basically 20 bytes, which is an identifier of an Ethereum address. Um, and this address is used for identifying who is running the code or who is deploying it or who owns it and who wants to be the destination of the payment and so on and so forth. So primitive types, no, no mystery here, no magic, very straightforward. 
Um, so here we have um, three variables. We have an address, string, and unsigned integer. We have um, an owner, uh, which is represented by address. We have the latest hash and balance. Uh, and then we have a function which um, returns an unsigned integer. And then we have a couple of uh, statements. So we have a variable x, which is 16. So what type is x? Well, the uh, compiler will def uh, infer the type of this variable to be the smallest one, which can hold that, that variable, right? Uh, so most likely that will be unsigned in eight, right? So um, kind of the um, the small smallest int that is there for storing 16. Uh, 300 is bigger than eight bits. So that will be probably unsigned in 16, right? Uh, if you don't want the compiler to be guessing what what those types are, you kind of can specify the type yourself, right? So this one specifies the Z to be unsigned integer. Uh, and then the value of Z will be zero. It's initialized on the start. Um, and then we have uh, some more code. So we see that X is actually assigned to 300, which means the uint 8 will not work. We need uint 16 uh, for this. So, you know, that will be inferred from the from the code. We have two more uints. And then there is kind of a, a nice construct, which you have in some programming languages, which is destructuring. So you can have a tuple and then you can make an assignment to a tuple and then get A and B assigned to one and two, right? So this structuring, if you took the some of the code uh, classes with uh, Rust and Haskell, uh, they also have uh, this structuring. So you, will, you are familiar with this. So no magic here. Uh, arrays are fixed length uh, and variable length. So you have two types of uh, arrays. Um, and you have memory arrays, which use a new keyword. Uh, and you have um, uh, yeah, you have um, sort of uh, buffers or byte arrays, which are kind of a fixed uh, storage location. So it's a little bit uh, better to use that. Uh, uh, I don't know why I said uh, then by the race. This is a by the race, yeah. So here we have um, a by the array. We pushing two numbers to the, to it, uh, and then ah oh yeah okay. So um, so this is more expensive than uh, this, right? Whoops. Oops, sorry, sorry. So you you can have up to thirty two, right? So if you if if you need to store up to thirty two bytes, it's better to use a variable which is a a specific byte fixed byte size array than to do this kind of a dynamic uh, array with byte uh, square brackets, right? You kind of get the idea. So th this is just a single variable which con occupies three bytes or you know four bytes or whatever you want um, so if you want to store four things it's better to say byte four instead of saying um like this byte you know like this and then pushing and popping from it right um so here we have byte three and we say we have three bytes and we have uh, you know zero um three and two in those three bytes right Okay, uh, files are called uh, whatever you want, .sol. Uh, you can import other uh, sol files by saying import a file name. Um, so it will import all the global symbols from the file name .sol into this file. Um, you have, uh, you can uh, import everything with that particular prefix. Uh, 
using this notation or this notation. Uh, and then you will have a kind of a global symbol, which you can say global uh, symbol name dot whatever and refer to the variables from here, right? Not to have the name collision, right? Because otherwise, if you do this, then all the names from this one are kind of visible in the global scope, right? Um, and then you have a little bit more fancy way of mapping the uh, paths. So you don't need to fiddle with this now. Uh, we have um, one-line comments and multi-line comments. Uh, you have also this for documentation and Doxygen usually works uh, fine. And then the functions are kind of similar to JavaScript. So you say function, you say the name, parameter types always come before the variables. And then, as I said, you don't really have class, you have contract. So you can define kind of a contract with some state uh, inside the contract. Uh, and you kind of, the structure looks very much like JavaScript. And you're using those uh, those types that you have available. Um, so then when you want to return, you can return a tuple or you can return a single thing. Uh, and then you can call the function. So we're calling the new deposit function and you can see we're doing this structuring again. So we're getting the first wind for all deposit and the new, the next, Point as a new deposit. Um, and then the, 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 the function basically does something inside. So there are some uh, function visibility primitives that you can use to limit what is visible from the current contract to outside. So public kind of everything, everybody can see it and can access it and mutate it, uh, private. Uh, it's visible only within the current contract. So from external contracts, they cannot access those uh, things which are marked private. Uh, uh, and then uh, internal is visible only from within the contract, but not from external transactions. So if another transaction calls this contract, then from this contract, you can use it, but not from the external one. Uh, and then... Uh, external is visible only from the external transactions, but not from the current one. Um, if I mark something private uh, inside my Solidity, will it be visible in the blockchain? Yes, it will be visible. So inside the blockchain, everything is actually visible. So I can read the state of everything. Uh, even if I mark something private. So it doesn't mean nobody can see it. Everybody can see it, but from the contract, from somebody else's contract code, they cannot see it and they cannot access it, right? So for, in terms of privacy, private doesn't actually introduce any privacy for you. It only in, introduces contract visibility such that things are programmatically not accessible. But a human can go to a blockchain explorer and can see all the private state of any contract which is there. So you cannot really hide anything, right? So if let's say you want to store a private key in a, in a smart contract, the private key will be visible in the blockchain. Uh, it, it cannot be hidden. So you have to encrypt it or you have to hash it or you have to do something with it such that the, the public visible part is not leaking any privacy. Um, so it's a little bit tricky to be doing kind of things that require privacy because everything that happens in smart contract is kind of visible in the blockchain. Uh, we have some accessor um, functions. Uh, so if I have a public state deposit, there will be a new function which is called deposit. Uh, and you, you know anybody can call it and read the value of that of that state of that variable, right? It's sort of a... Uh, so this contract will have an automatically generated function called deposit that will access the value from the, from the storage. And then we have a number of function modifiers uh, which we can define ourselves and they will make the function, it, it's sort of like an assertion which has to evaluate to true, otherwise the function cannot be called. Um, so it's kind of a useful mechanism uh, which allows us to change the behavior of the functions uh, and automatically check some preconditions such that 
um, things are kind of easier to, to be expressed. So I think I have an example. Yeah. So I have um, a, a modifier which is called only owner and the only owner, owner checks if the owner if the field owner the address of the owner is the same as the sender of the particular message of the particular call to the contract and then it says oh, like if somebody calls the close method who is not the owner it will do nothing but if the owner calls the close method the contract will self destruct so the contract has um basically uh um three states so once you deploy the contract it's kind of deployed and the contract can can do things um then if you self destruct the contract the contract is in kind of inactive state so it's still all the history and everything stays in the blockchain but nobody can call the contract anymore and the contract will not change the state will cannot do anything anymore and then there are kind of a zombie contracts so zombie contracts are so contracts which are defunct or broken or for some reason not used anymore but they are still active and still re remain in the blockchain they cannot be kind of uh, garbage collected there is no mechanism for kind of a garbage collection in um, in blockchains as we know them for now okay so we have another uh, contract so you also see kind of a throw call. Um, so the, any any function and any um, contract can throw, which means the contract will uh, revert back to the original state and it like nothing will happen in the blockchain, but the uh, there are two mechanisms. One where you consume the gas used for running it uh, so that, that that means it's sort of um, uh, used for preventing abuse in, in, inside the code and one which doesn't do that. So the one which doesn't do that is the one which basically is used for development to make sure that the contracts are kind of uh, uh, correctly implemented and correctly deployed. But then for the production, usually you sort of use the, the first mechanism. Um, some of those um, uh, has changed. So I I think the, I, I, I haven't double checked it, but I think the constant has been changed to pure, uh, which means the pure functions will not read or modify the state of the contract, but they will basically do some operation on the, on the um, parameters and they will return the computed value such that the function can be evaluated outside of the contract itself because it doesn't need the contract state to to work properly um, and then there are, there are a couple of mechanisms which are a little bit more advanced so um, people can write wrong code and uh, call functions on the contract which not supposed to have payments uh, or not supposed to have certain behaviors so then there is a kind of a fallback function which takes care if somebody called the contract without the proper function name or without um, or with the payment that's not supposed to be there or whatever. So if the, the API is kind of misused uh, because um, uh, the default behavior is to reject the call, but you can have a, you can implement your own behavior and then you can kind of deal with the um, edge cases yourself. Um, so then, for example, a uh, bank contract will forbid uh, unsolicited payments into the account because you have a fallback function which rejects payments from accounts which you don't know about. Um, yeah, so there is a little bit more. And there is um, storage, uh, storage system. Again, it's a little bit complicated. So um, you have... Um, kind of a, a, a memory storage. You have kind of a stack storage like in other programming languages and then you have storage, uh, which is the kind of a blockchain storage. Uh, and then we have events. So events is a mechanism where you can uh, 
kind of lock something that has happened into like an event queue uh, and those events are kind of are really cheap and you they can be checked kind of for free uh from the blockchain itself so kind of emitting an event is kind of like uh emitting some metadata into the transactions such that you can easily check all those events kind of a post-mortem for free without running the the code they are basically stored in the in the blockchain itself um okay so contracts can inherit from another contract then there is a keyword is uh so you can inherit uh some basic uh behavior from a base contract um and then they, if if you have multiple inheritance, if you say is this contract that contract and another contract, if you have used like uh, three contracts and there is a conflict of names that you're calling something, then they use the kind of a Python model for um, linearizing the um, inheritance. That those are kind of a more abstract um, uh, concepts. We don't need to know them for now. Uh, Self-destruct is kind of very important. Uh, so this one tries to remove the contract and transfers uh, uh, and transfers all the current value of the contract to the given address, right? So whoever is self-destructing the contract will get uh, will get the final transfer of all the tokens which are in that address uh, to the new address, which is a parameter of that call. Uh, so each contract is kind of a uh, deployed on a particular address. And then this address holds the tokens which are transferred into the contract. Um, so um, we have kind of a branching and loops. It's the same as in the in JavaScript. No, uh, no major um, surprises there. The only uh, thing is that the language is strict. So we don't convert from non-bool to bool. So you you basically all your loops and all your if things have to use a bool variables for um, the part that requires a logic. Um, okay, we will not call external con contracts yet. Uh, let me see. Yeah, let's have a look at the at this contract. So. This is a contract coin. And the main point of this is to define a new token, which uh, you can use uh, to send and receive uh, from your own community, right? It's kind of like a defining your own cryptocurrency. Uh, so this contract has a couple of const constructs. Um, so the, the first one we often say in which um, version of Solidity a given contract was written, such that you are guarantee compliance because solidity is a kind of a language that keeps evolving keeps changing the uh the semantics as you can see there is there has been quite a number of breaking changes from uh 0 0.5 so when you specify your code you usually say for which version of solidity this code is safe and they say well for version 8.4 and up right so then they have kind of a mentor, uh, which is a public address. Uh, and then they have mapping between the addresses and the balances, and it's called balances. So we have two public uh, fields for the contract, uh, one which specify who the mentor is, who can issue new coins, and then who owns how many coins by this mapping between addresses and wins. And then we have... Um, an event which says this address transferred to this ad uh, from this address to this address there has been a transfer with that amount um, and we're using unsigned integers for amounts so amounts are integers so how do we deal with floating points like if we want to represent you know uh, ten dollars and ten cents how do we do that We represent everything as cents. So then we only have integers, right? 
So instead of saying 10.10, .10, we say 1010 because it is 10.10, right? Okay, so then uh, we have a constructor. So whoever is deploying this contract will be the sender because the sender is deploying the contract. And then <clears throat> we have basically initialized that the minter uh, is the, the original owner of the contract, the one who deployed the contract, right? That's usually the case. You may say, uh, I actually had a project last semester uh, with uh, a student from Italy and he wanted to have a coin for something with his teacher and they both supposed to be able to issue new coins to, to the class. Uh, so they wanted to have two minters, right? So the minter was an array and it had two addresses. It had an uh, address of the teacher and the address of the student. Um, so then we have a mint function and the mint function basically uh, checks if the sender, if the caller of that function is the, you know, the minter. Uh, and then it says uh, that uh, that particular receiver, which is uh, a key in the balances uh, mappings, will get this extra money out of thin air, right? So out of thin air, we just created that amount of new coins and gave it to the receiver, right? So that's how this particular contract uh, mints kind of coins. Um, and then we have a kind of an error which says, uh, I have an insufficient balance between the balance requested and the balance available. And then we have a kind of a, a function sent, which sends a certain amount um, from the sender to the receiver, right? Uh, you, you could have a version of this, of this function differently. You could say, send sender receiver amount and then you would be defining who the sender is but in this particular case the original sender of them of the call is the one who sends the money so why we do that this way so so if i rewrote this call um if i Let's let's say we have the logic like this. Uh, so we have sent, and currently we have a receiver and an amount, and then we do the logic. What would be the difference if we say sent, sender, a receiver, an amount? What what we have to think about in this case? Let's uh, let's rename the function to call it transfer. Yeah, you have to do that. So there are a couple of checks we, we have to do. So one is a uh, balance check, right? Balance check. So we have to check if the sender, so if the sender has uh, more money than the amount. So uh, we basically are doing kind of a balances balances of the sender has to be bigger than an amount for the transfer to be possible, right? Yes, we need to do this, but we need to do this in both cases. But what else can, what else do we need to check? In this case. So in this case, if we check the code, um, they basically say they check if the balance um, 
you see my screen, right? Yeah, so if the balance of the sender is um, smaller than the amount, then we have an error. And we basically are throwing up the, we're throwing up the insufficient balance error. Um, if that's not the case, we basically say, okay, um, the balances of the sender is less now uh, of that amount. The balances of the receiver is bigger than the amount. And we emit the, you know, the event. We say there has been a transfer and the sender sent to the receiver that amount, right? So th this, this is just like a log. This doesn't do anything. The actual logic is here, right? The actual logic is those two lines. So the only check which we did here is the check if the sender has enough balance. If we did this method instead, what we would need to check? So imagine that we created this coin, right? So we have the coin created and we have, um, uh, I, I, let's say I, I, we all have uh, 10 coins each, okay? If we have this method, uh, each of us can send money to each of us by calling this method, right? But if we have this method, what 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 is possible? When calling this method, it's possible for me to say, Alexander pays me 10, 10 coins, right? <laughs> so the additional check we have to say is, who do we allow to make transfers, right? Um, because we could say, uh, we only allow the owner of the account to make transfers, which is the, the option of, of one, which is what we, is kind of coded here. Uh, so this function basically allows only the owner of the account to send money, right? But nobody else can send money. So let's say Alexander died, I'm, I'm sorry, there is 10 coins on in your bank account. And because you died and you, you took your private key with you because you memorized it, nobody can transfer money out of your balance anymore, right? So maybe you want to have a mechanism which says, actually there is like an owner or, or somebody who can transfer his money out of his account who is uh, allowed to do that. And then we would have function like this, but we would limit who can call it with Alexander being in this place, right? So it's either Alexander or the owner maybe, right? It's kind of up to you. Like you do, you design the behavior of, of your contracts, right? Uh, but you have to think um, how they work because people who are calling the, the API, th this is what message sender is, right? Uh, and then the behavior is what will happen, right? So if we rewrote it like this, I would call his contract to send, I mean, I would call this contract to send his money to myself, right? Uh, which is probably not what you would like to have. But then again, as I said, like this implementation doesn't allow to recover the money in any way if he forgets his private key, right? If Alexander forgets his private key, then the money are un unmovable, like nobody can move them anywhere, right? So you have to plan it because once you deploy the contract, there is no upgrade. You cannot modify your contracts. Uh, the contracts are what they are. Once they are deployed, they are there forever. And then you cannot fix your bugs, right? So if you didn't think about something, then you have kind of a problem. Uh, so you have to sort of think about things kind of uh, <laughs> into the future. All right, so this is a very simple code. Uh, we sort of understand what's going on and we kind of follow it, I hope. Uh, and this concept of releasing your own tokens has been um, very common. Like uh, if you go to coin market cap, you will see that there is um, uh, there is currently twenty one thousand uh, you know cryptocurrencies. Uh, so it's very easy to create your own cryptocurrency and and launch it. And most of them are what's called uh, ERC twenty token. ERC-20 token is a standard way of releasing new cryptocurrencies on Ethereum blockchain such that they have a certain API 
uh, which is um, kind of a fixed. So the ERC20 token uh, has, um, it has uh, certain methods, which I, let's see if I see the, Yeah, so maybe it's here, ERC20, yes. So it has kind of a, a, a certain uh, standard functions which are easy for wallets to work with, such that your standard wallet can work with any ERC token. So they basically have a name and symbol, how many decimal places you have because we represent money as integers, but you can kind of display them as having some floating point as we did with the euro and cents. Uh, how much total supply of the token is. Uh, and then a balance of particular account, a transfer function between the recipient and the amount. So this is the version, which is the recipient and the amount which we had before. Uh, who can spend money? Uh, who can approve uh, spenders. And then you you see we have a function which is called transfer from sender to recipient, right? And the spenders can call this function. Nobody else can call this function, only the spenders can call. And the spenders are defined by the allowance and approval mechanism, right? Um, and then you can kind of increase the allowance, which um, allow, allows the spenders to spend up to how much, and then decrease the allowance. And then the rest is sort of uh, private methods, which are used for managing the, uh, the contract itself. And this ERC20 token contract, uh, you can get it from uh, Open Zeppelin. Open Zeppelin is like a set of libraries which define some predefined tested smart contracts, which you can just copy and paste into your own system and use them. And that's what we want to do for Wednesday. So for Wednesday, the homework is, you should install uh, Remix and you should install Truffle. You should install Genak Genaki um, uh, blockchain generator. You should launch it, generate kind of 10 tokens for yourself and uh, issue some transactions using the, the visual tools that you have. And then try to download the ERC20 token smart contract and deploy it uh, on, the, on your laptop um, system. And then use a wallet to kind of connect to your own system to see how many tokens you have. Um, what we will do on Wednesday, once you reach that point, we will use a test net and we will deploy that Con smart contract on actually testnet such that we all can send tokens to one another, right? Using the same global testnet that um, everybody can has access to. Because the local one on, on your laptop is only visible to you. Uh, it's not visible to anybody else and nobody else can kind of connect to it. Uh, but if we deploy it on the testnet, then we can kind of play with it. Does it make sense? You kind of know what you need to do? You may not do it, you may not finish it, and then we will kind of finish it on Wednesday if you get stuck, right? Uh, but try, like try to do as much as you can at home and then uh, either individually or as a group uh, or, or pairs, it doesn't matter. Um, it just matters that we kind of get to a point where each of you can deploy a, an ERC20 token on a testnet and kind of uh, configure your wallet to see it. Uh, and then we can just send some tokens from one person to another person. <clears throat> all right, so that's that's all for today.